there can be no question as to the authority of railroad officials under government control to perform all of their usual duties, and there has been no lack of support from the railroad administration when these duties were properly and diligently performed. This is a quote from a review of the work of a government body that once existed to ensure national rail service flow throughout the nation. You may be surprised to find out that this quote and the relevant agency is from the United States. The United States Railroad Administration, the USRA, existed from 1916 to 1920 and came into existence at a time where the private rail industry was clearly not working for the betterment of the state at war. While the United States entered the First World War late, they had agreed to supply many European allies with munitions, arms, and other such war material necessary to fight against the enemy. By 1915 alone, the United States rail network was over 260,000 miles, or 420 kilometers, in length. Around one-sixth of all trackage was in default. There were over 400 railway companies operating across the nation, and they fought not just against each other for market dominance, but also against the very state itself, which tried to set measures in line with the war effort. Around the same time, Unions, representing various workers on the railroads, were fighting for an eight-hour working day and better working conditions. Their working conditions were judged by the Commission on Industrial Relations. This nine-member commission was launched to investigate working conditions not just in the industrial sector, but also in American agricultural practices. The commission was led by a labor lawyer from Kentucky and sought to find not just the cause, but also the cure for industrial violence in the United States. Why were people doing such violent acts? Well, among the findings of the commission, they found, quote, We hold that efforts to stay the organization of labor or to restrict the right of employees to organize should not be tolerated, but that the opposite policy should prevail, and the organization of the trade unions and of the employees' associations should be promoted. This country is no longer a field for slavery, and where men and women are compelled, in order that they may live, to work under conditions in determining which they have no voice, they are not far removed from the conditions existing under feudalism or slavery. With the passage of the Adamson Act in 1916, railroad workers were provided an eight-hour working day. Yet, it took a fight in the United States Supreme Court for insurance that the railroad companies would comply with the legislation. The disorganization of private rail would remain a factor for several months and delay the shipment of European arms, passenger transit, and fracture the economy. With Proclamation 1419 delivered by President Woodrow Wilson and intended to go into effect in late 1917, the railroads and most other transport infrastructure would come under not just state supervision, but direct control from the central government and armed forces. This was necessary for the security of the nation and commerce. Passenger rail services would indeed continue and it was to a degree where the state produced several travel posters advertisements for the California Rail Service and other localities. Rail transport went from an industry with over 400 companies to a single, well-respected and well-funded government agency. The United States Railroad Administration ensured that electric rail was maintained and expanded. The administration established standards which would last well beyond the life of its work. The USRA also set about to ensure that empty boxcars 
languishing in rail yards, would be put to use hauling wheat, mail, and passengers between rural areas of the nation. That was not something seen as profitable by private enterprise, but certainly is important for national interests, whether at war or in peacetime. The administration also instituted pay raises for workers at all levels. A rail worker who may have earned $40 each month would see a raise of $20, while a locomotive engineer who earned $200 may see a raise of $45 each month. This was an experiment that did not have to end the way it did. And yet, railroad firms after the war were able to not only gain access to the boxcars and trains, they also were able to get back the physical infrastructure through court. The railroad firms, as I understood it, would sue the federal government multiple times for hundreds of millions of dollars, claiming that the state authority entrusted to manage railroad infrastructure conducted property damage. This is a history Americans rarely hear about. Instead, Americans are typically inundated with doomerism and the failures of statecraft. Conrail, a later attempt at nationalization, was deliberately constructed to fail. This earlier institution, however, was perfectly capable of continuing its work had it been given the ability to do so. I hope that you liked today's presentation. If you did, I encourage you to leave a comment or like the video, share it around to those you think may be interested. If you like the topics I cover on this channel, please feel free to subscribe for more. I will see you in the next video. Thanks for taking the time.